Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this helps my content get in front of more people. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes that starts with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Today, I'm excited. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Robert Sykes. This is our second conversation. I enjoyed our conversation so much. Last time, I will put that in the show notes. I think a lot of you guys really enjoyed our conversation that was really applicable and actionable to having better optimized health as well as physique on a ketogenic diet. He has a new book out. It is called The Ketogenic Bodybuilding by Robert Sykes. There is so much helpful information. There are graphics in here and charts and lists, even nutrition. Um, There's a lot of information, so I highly recommend looking at this book. There's also information about mindset and just preparing you as to what you'll go through if you're really trying to competition prep. And even if you're going through refeeds and uh, reverse dieting and all of these things that we touch upon. Robert Sykes is a natural bodybuilding competitor, a keto expert, podcaster, vlogger, and Robert Sykes has his pro card. He works with clients one-on-one to use his knowledge to help people on a ketogenic diet and to help athletes perform to their maximum capacity. I have so much respect for Robert as he is changing so much of the space of bodybuilding and that you don't need to do high protein and low fat to get to optimal weight and physique um, that you can do a ketogenic version and actually do better and even be better for your hormones and overall health. In this conversation, we talk a lot about protein sparing modified fast, as well as extended fasting. And we talk about competition prep, how to best exercise and lift in order to have lean body mass. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Robert. It's so good to see you again. Um, The last time we interviewed People loved the discussion, so I'll put that in our show notes. But you know, thanks again for joining me. Um, I have your new book, and I'm really excited to just talk about it. For the people that don't know you, if you can just introduce yourself. Yeah, so a quick little high-level view of me. I'm Robert Sykes, Keto Savage. I've been uh, natural bodybuilding for about 14 years now, and I've been strictly ketogenic for seven of those years. Um, I got my pro card in 2017 with a ketogenic approach. And I've pretty much since dedicated my life to educating others about uh, optimizing their performance with a ketogenic approach because it's done so well for me. I've, I've had, um, I've done all the different types of diets. I've done a whole bunch of carbs in the past that led to a bunch of disordered eating tendencies. And for me, keto helped uh, mitigate all that, especially in the context of a competition prep in which hormones are in a state of flux. And there's just a lot of, a lot of variables at play. So I'm a big fan of the ketogenic carnivore-esque diet, and uh, I'm just happy to spread the word. And uh, let's dive into this book. So, I mean, is it for, who is it for, you know, what is it about? Is it just to bodybuild? I mean, can somebody like me read it? If you can tell me a little bit about the book. Yeah. So it's definitely written for competitors. However, the same principles that I use for my competitive athlete clients can totally be applied to just people wanting to improve their composition. I mean, most of my clients are not competitors right. um, and I use the exact same principles that I do with my competitors on them and it works beautifully well. I mean, we're all people. So if we're doing things uh, with the same protocol, I mean, you, you're probably not going to need to read the chapter on how to put the, the tanning solution on and everything like that for the show and how to do the proper poses. But as far as improving your body composition, optimizing for fat loss uh, while retaining as as much muscle as possible. All those rules still apply if you're competing or not for sure. And then, um, in terms of, um, so one of the biggest questions I get is macros. Mm -hmm. Do you have a specific macro or targeted macro that you try to hit with people? Is it different for people that are trying to compete versus, I mean, I I think you just kind of answered that, but thoughts on macros and what is ideal macros? Yeah. So it's, it's funny. I mean, I've, I've seen this, the, the keto space, the low carb space, they, they change so frequently. I've seen all these hypes come and go for a while. There was, you know, high fat, low protein. Now it's probably high protein, low fat. Um, and for me, like, I don't ever really want to identify myself as being in one standalone camp and back myself into a corner. Um, with my clients, I'm adjusting macros every single week based off of how their body's responding. I typically start them at a higher fat ratio and then then I increase their protein and drop their fat uh, throughout the first several months of the prep 
so I can figure out their unique protein threshold. That's going to be different for everybody. Uh, and then from that point on, I start dropping both protein and fat, uh, which is going to have an increasing effect on their overall fat ratio. And that's honestly because as they get closer to the end of a prep, their body fat's the lowest that it has been. Their calories are the lowest. So having a higher fat ratio in that setting is better for hormonal health and just providing enough energy uh, to you know, go about the daily training needs. And then when you say protein threshold, what does that mean? I would define protein threshold. So a lot of people in the space right now are just saying, Hey, look, eat protein at nauseum that you can't have too much protein. It's perfect. You know, but the, the simple fact of the matter is depending on your goals, you're going to have a caloric limit. Like you don't want to exceed that calorie intake. If your goal is to, you know, lose body fat and optimize for fat loss. Uh, you don't want to go too low because that's going to have a negative implication from a hormonal standpoint, from an energy standpoint. Right. So if you only have so many calories to work with, there is a point at which any increase in protein at the expense of fat, if you're doing a fat adapted approach or carbs, if you're using carbs is going to result in, uh, you know, the point of diminishing returns, so to speak, like you want to make sure you're having enough protein to optimize for muscle building and recovery, but you don't want to have so much protein at the expense of fat that your energy starts to suffer because having enough energy to train properly in the gym is also going to be incredibly muscle sparing if you're doing it cut. So making sure that you're, you know, not exceeding that at the expense of your primary energy source is super important. Uh, for most people, when I'm working with them throughout the course of a prep, I start to notice they hit their threshold and they'll experience higher blood glucose, lower blood ketones, uh, some bloating and GI distress, a little bit more brain fog, less mental clarity and acuity, and just less energy overall. And at that point, I'll start dropping both their protein and their fat. That's interesting. I had a similar experience when I first went carnivore. I didn't know how much meat to eat because I didn't eat meat for 12 years and mm -hmm. I would hear two pounds of meat. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to eat two pounds of meat. And every time yeah. I would eat two pounds of meat and I was doing one meal a day as well, my blood sugar would go up to the one fifties once. And I was tired. I needed a nap. And I was like, I don't think this is right, but I'm just going to keep, you know, carnivore harder or eat enough meat. But I don't think that was, I think that was too much protein for me at that time. And I wasn't aware. It's interesting because what you just brought up right now is that calories actually matter, right? So mm -hmm. let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, I know in the keto carnivore space, we'd say calories in calories out does not work. It's not true. We need to just focus on fat and proteins and don't worry about the calories. And I think there's been a slight shift back because maybe a lot of people were gaining weight on just fat and protein. And so they're saying, okay, maybe calories do matter a bit, but can you talk about how to find that fine balance between calories and the fat and protein? Can we eat excess of even good foods and gain weight because the calories are too high for our specific body? Yeah, 100%. You can absolutely gain weight on a strict carnivore approach. Uh, I know many people that have done it. I've done it. It's totally okay. possible. So I think, I think the argument against calories and calories in, calories out is in large part due to like the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, which... People can poke holes through that in some form or fashion. I agree with parts of it. I disagree with parts of it. But I, I do find that it's much easier to eat intuitively on a carnivore keto approach because you're not having all the highly palatable you know, processed sugars and grains coming into the diet. Uh, so you're not having those big fluctuations in blood insulin, uh, the, the dips, the falls, and then, you know, those cravings. So I think eating intuitively and not obsessing about calories is certainly more doable on a carnivore keto approach. However, if you're trying to optimize your body composition, throwing caution to the wind and assuming that calories have no effect whatsoever is certainly not going to bode well for your success. I mean, when I'm doing a competition prep, the only variable that I manipulate, uh, you know, extensively is calories. And that single manipulation is what results in me being able to get from 15% body fat to sub 5% body fat. Now, yes, my hormones are changing during that time. There's a lot of other variables at play, but the, the main thing that I personally am manipulating is my caloric intake. So calories absolutely matter when it comes to improving uh, body recomposition, building muscle mass. I mean, all that stuff definitely matters. Do you think there's a, you know, for someone that's not in competition, but just wants to have a, you know, a relatively healthy physique, um, just not struggling with metabolic syndrome. Is there a certain, like a minimum calorie threshold you require for males and females? I see. So like when I'm, when I'm working with clients, um, I have like a, a caloric floor that I don't like taking my clients beneath for, uh, females. I typically don't ever take their calories below 1300. And that's at the very end of a competition prep for a very finite period of time. Oh, okay. I've got a few clients, like I've got some females that are, you know, five feet tall and weigh 95 pounds. And I may take them as low as 1200 calories for 
you know, a week or two at most. And even in that setting, they have a weekly keto caloric refeed. So they've got higher average intake for the week. But I see so many people just chronically restricting and staying at 1200 or 1300 calories for weeks or months or years on end. And that's certainly not optimal from a hormonal standpoint, whether you compete or not, I think everyone's going to benefit from having a period in a caloric surplus and a period in a caloric deficit. Your ability to build more lean muscle tissue is going to be amplified in a caloric surplus. And the more muscle tissue you have, the better your metabolic rate is going to be to begin with. So everyone's going to benefit from a, you know, quote unquote, building and cutting phase and cycling between those two. It's not really optimal to just try and maintain because at the end of the day, we're all getting older. We're not, no one's getting younger. So there's no such thing as really maintenance. So you're either getting better or you're getting worse. Uh, but yeah, I see way too many people just consuming far too little for far too long. Yeah. And I, I tend to see that too. And, and the danger becomes worse when people start eating ketogenic and they're no longer having the sugar hungers, right? The mm -hmm. insulin drops or the insulin increases, and then your blood sugar goes down and then people normally feel hangry, but you don't get that on a ketogenic diet. So more women, especially will say, Oh, I don't need to eat because I'm not hungry. I'm going by my hunger cues. And so they start eating less and less. And initially they'll lose weight, but over time it's disastrous in terms of hormones. You start stalling on weight and you're eating very little, and then you really can't go much lower from there. And that's where I see a lot of people will say, well, the diet doesn't work. It's the diet. That's the issue. But, you know, you mentioned about cutting and refeeding. Can you talk a little bit about what, what do these terms exactly mean? Yeah. So from a very high level view, you know, a building phase is simply being in a caloric surplus. So me, for instance, my caloric maintenance is about 3000 calories. So I can consume 3000 calories with my current day-to-day -day, you know, activity levels and my weight will hold fairly stable. When I'm in a building phase, trying to optimize for adding more muscle tissue, I'll bump that up to 3200, 3300, somewhere in there. And then when I'm in a competition prep, and I'm trying to optimize for fat loss, I'll start at around that maintenance intake of 3000. Then over the course of four to six months, I'll gradually chip away at that intake until I'm down to like 1700 calories for a week or two at the very apex of that cut. And then I'll reverse that back up to a healthy maintenance intake. So generally speaking, you want to spend more time in a maintenance or surplus than you do in a deficit because it takes quite a long time to build a muscle, especially naturally. Um, so I oftentimes recommend like a three to one ratio. If you're spending, you know, a third of your time in a, in a deficit, in a cut, spend the rest of that time in a surplus. Um, so that, that's a good general rule of thumb. But a lot of people, so the thing is when you, when you chronically restrict, you know, you, you will lose some weight initially for sure. And you'll, you possibly lose weight continuously, but a lot of that's going to be muscle tissue because you can't preserve your muscle and certainly not optimize for building muscle. If you're just eating sub 1000 calories. And the problem with that is people that, that restrict like that have a tendency to binge afterwards, they kind of fall into these binging and purging cycles and their hormones are in such a state of flux, their metabolic rate is in such a state of flux that their body's ability to uh, generate more fat cells and allow those fat cells that they have uh, to accumulate more adipose tissue is, is amplified. So right. it's possible to get worse and worse and worse as opposed to better and better and better in that context. Yeah, I had Menno Henselmas on um, after I had interviewed you last time. And it was scary because he said it's better if you are eating really restricted for five days and then have a day where you just binge out and and then you eat a really high excess surplus, it's actually worse for the body than if you were to just eat what the average of all of those calories were for like the full seven days. And that was really eye opening because I think most people think, oh, one day of just eating off plan is not a big deal. But I guess the studies show that that one day is actually a lot worse. Like you mentioned, it um, will increase the risk of having more fat cells. So it's. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, That's why I have such an issue with, you know, these competitors that, that do these crazy, cr crazy crash diets and then binge on everything in sites post show. I mean, I used to do that. I, I put on 24 pounds and. 30 hours after my first show, it's just not healthy. It's not sustainable. It really kind of has a, a negative psychological impact on how you view yourself and your relationship with food. And that's honestly why I'm not a fan of any crash diet. And that includes the protein sparing modified fast diets, because I mean, you're, you're looking at what the recommendations are for those. And it's oftentimes less than 600 calories for two or three days a week. And that becomes this negative feedback loop in which people are constantly, you know, eating very, very little and then, you know, purging or, or binging rather, uh, it just becomes a negative feedback loop. And same thing, honestly, with extended fasting, there's like fasting can be great, but if you're doing it in the wrong context, it's, it's going to do more harm than good.
I agree. So before we get into extended fasting and protein spring modified fast, I just wanted to clarify. So in your book, does it talk about the details of, cause you know, you mentioned the kind of bulking or um, eating in excess to then when you start cutting is the timeline of all of those in your book to understand like, how long do I have to do the bulking? How long do I have to do the cutting phases? Yeah. So for me personally, as a competitor, I try to look better every single time I step on stage, which is why I do not compete every single year as a natural athlete. Since it does take so much time to build muscle, if you compete every single year and you spend four to six months worth of time dieting, and then two or three months of time reverse dieting before you know it, you spent nine, 10 months out of the year in a deficit. So your ability to build more muscle and look better the next time you step on stage is significantly diminished. So I'll typically spend, you know, four to six months cutting two or three months reverse dieting. And then I'll spend the next two, two and a half, sometimes three years in a caloric surplus before I diet down for another show. For somebody that's not competing, they're just trying to improve their, their body composition and health, you know, doing so over the course of, you know, maybe cutting for three months and then being in a building phase for, you know, six or nine or 12 months out of the year would be advantageous. Uh, honestly, the more time you can spend in a surplus, especially if you're at a healthy weight to begin with, like, I mean, you, there's no need to go to an extreme bulking phase in which case you have 50 plus pounds to lose in order to see your abs. I mean, it's not really optimal. Uh, but if you're able to, to maintain within, you know, 20 pounds or so of what would be a potential stage weight, then you can maintain that, uh, you know, in a healthy state and not have to do a crazy building phase and then a drastic cutting phase. If you are competing every year, I can see what you mean by that. I never thought about mm -hmm. that. It's so smart. Let's talk about the protein sparing modified fast and in the, even the extended fast. So um, I know both you and I are not the biggest fans of protein sparing modified fast, just because like you mentioned, normally it's required to do it two to three times a week where you eat just protein with very, very limited fat, meaning that you are eating as much if you want of like chicken breast all throughout the day, but really you cannot add any more added fat. Most people that have even tried one meal doing that, they notice that they're ravenous, they don't feel satiated, and they feel almost, especially if they struggled with disordered eating, they're mm -hmm. going back and forth to the pantry because they're not satiated, they want something more. And for a lot of people, if they do it long enough, they notice that their hair starts falling out and they're just not feeling well. And so that is overall my point of view as why I'm not the biggest fan of protein sparing modified fast. And I think of if we have to do this kind of diet or lifestyle until we're the age of hundred, are we really going to do PSMF every three, uh, three times a week or two times a week until the age of hundred, that seems like a lot of effort to just maintain weight. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely not a fan. I mean, I've spoken out about it. I've gotten some heat from that uh, for sure. sure. I mean, at the end of the day, like I'm all about sustainability. And if you're having to do something so drastic that it is, you know, not sustainable, then it's probably not the best option. And when you look at protein sparing modified fast, the, the typical recommendation is far less than a thousand calories. Like oftentimes in the ballpark of 400 to 600 calories, that is literally less than what is recommended for a six month old infant. That is literally less than what a lot of the documentation was shown for, uh, you know, prisoners in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. I mean, when you're consuming less than they were consuming, that's certainly not a good thing. Uh, certainly not optimal for building muscle, certainly not optimal for protecting hormonal health and metabolic rate. I feel like a lot of the advocates for protein sparing modified fast suggest that it is better than extended fast. I mean, there's probably some studies that showcase, hey, look, if you're eating some protein, that's going to be more protective towards your muscle than nothing at all. And I agree that may be true, but I, I would view it as the, the better of two evils, so to speak. I don't recommend doing fasting in the context of trying to, to lose body fat. Like I, I think fasting is great from a, uh, you know, we could use some of the buzzwords, you know, autophagy, cell turnover, cell apoptosis. We can, we can do all that with fasting, but if you're doing extended fasting for the sole point of just losing body fat, there are better, healthier, more sustainable ways to go about it. I, I think, and I think of fasting the same way, right? So if, if you have to do like extended fast, meaning over 36 to 48 hour fast and do that two to three times a week, I think two, maybe two times a week. Can you do that until you're the age of hundred, right? You have to not eat for two days um, a week to maintain your weight. And I think maybe when you're first healing, that's fine. 
But I Mm -hmm. think as you are trying to find maintenance, I don't think it's a sustainable way to live. And I I think the risk is, and I've mentioned this before, but the risk is um, the binging with proteins bearing modified fast, the restriction, the, that feeling of the body is not being nourished. And again, that you have the desires to go binge. And then even with the extended fast, either you are um, under eating over time um, because the refeeds are so much harder to get in enough calories or you end up binging because you're like, okay, now it's my eating window. I can eat whatever I want. And so it just both avenues can be options for a temporary bit. But I think in terms of longevity and long-term, if this is, it doesn't seem that sustainable yet. It's so popular right now. Yeah. I mean, for me, like I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor and I'm a medical professional, but I work with clients every single day. I mean, I've, I've always tried to maintain my skills and keep sharp by working with clients continuously throughout since since I've been doing this really. And one thing I've seen this massive uptick in is female clients in particular that have come to me and they say, Hey, look, I've been doing protein sparing modified fast. I've lost a few pounds, but I plateaued and I'll start going back in their history. Like, Hey, what have you been average? What's your average intake been over the past four to six months? And they all say like sub 1300 calories. So if I don't take my competitive clients that are sub 10% body fat and stepping on stage to earn their pro card down that low how does it make sense for the average human being that that doesn't need to go that low to sustainably or not sustainably, but consistently stay that low? That just doesn't make sense. So I think there needs to be further discussion around that. And I feel like a lot of people that are advocates for the protein sparing modified fast are not talking about the other end of the spectrum, which is being in a caloric surplus for times and all the benefits that come with that. So people are just inundated with this constant talk of eat less, eat less, eat less. And they'll lose a little bit of weight. You know, they'll drop some water weight. They may lose a few pounds. They'll get addicted to that temporary change in the scale. And then they'll just keep returning to it. And they'll start exceeding that two or three day recommendation of protein spray modified fast. And they start doing it more frequently than not. I mean, just being really candid, I think a lot of the people that are really, really advocates of just really, really lean protein days, they are on the very lean side. And so I you know, just working with clients with a lot of hormone imbalances. I mean, we store, especially women, we store some of our excess hormones that we may need, like the sex hormones. If we're under a lot of stress, we need those hormones like cortisol, for example, and our sex hormones, but we store it in our fat. And so if we have zero fat, I mean, the risk of hormone imbalances and then thyroid imbalances will come to play. And I think if we think about a lot of these tribes and communities that were meat based or carnivore, they're not really thin, they're more muscular, right? Like, uh, there's been a picture that's been going around about the Mongolians, and they're like big people. They're not these really waif looking people. So I think it's something to consider. I I get it, people want to be thin. I mean, I'm, I'm a woman, I get that. But sometimes I think we push it too far. Because the desire to be thin um, sometimes then can affect our ability to have optimal health. And that's why I always share, you have to pick a side in that sense. Working with you is a great option to do, get to a body composition that's maybe desirable, but doing it in the healthiest, safest way makes more sense. But for the average person that's not trying to compete, maybe it's okay that we have a little bit more fat that we can maybe pinch that's not necessarily harmful to our body. For me, it's so important that we prioritize our body's health rather than just being thin. And these kind of fad diets, um, while they may be effective in the moment, I think the downstream effects are, they they can be harmful. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about it, it's like, you like, you're not getting like protein is not a great substrate for energy. It just yeah. isn't, you know, you're like, you're either getting your energy from carbohydrates, you're getting your energy from fat or inefficiently through gluconeogenesis in the excess of protein. Right. So like for me as an athlete, or honestly, just for anybody that wants to live a vibrant you know, life, you want to have energy coming in to fuel your workouts, your activities, you playing with the kids at the park, whatever it is you're doing. And if you're consuming hardly any dietary fat or dietary carbohydrates, you're not going to have very great energy. And if you are not, if you have a lot of weight to lose, uh, you know, sure you can tap into your stored body fat, but I feel like there's a tipping point at which case, if you're not consuming hardly any dietary fat, your body's not going to be as efficient as it possibly could be at tapping into your own stored fat. So, I mean, our bodies are smart. It makes it, it knows to make use of what's coming in. And if you have zero fat coming in, it's certainly not going to be optimized from a fat burning standpoint. I agree with that. So I get a lot of clients where they are overweight or obese. And so they hear if you have fat on your body, you shouldn't be eating fat, a ketogenic diet. If you just 
remove the carbohydrates, you'll be in ketosis. And so therefore your body will use fat, but it's just not true. If you eat mostly meat and you're not adding any plants and you're not eating any of the carbohydrates, if your protein consumption is really high, your body will turn it into gluconeogenesis, which will then make your insulin higher. And so when your glucose and insulin is high, just from protein, you won't be able to tap into the stores as well as if you were to just reduce a little bit of the protein and then add more fat. And then you can use the fatty acids for energy. And I think people don't see that because maybe they're not checking their blood glucose and ketones, but you can easily check that way as well. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, people have often asked me like, why don't I give this diet a try? But the reality is before I ever even was keto right. and I was doing the bro dieting, you know, when it came to competition prep, I mean, I was eating super high protein, like 300 grams of protein a day was average for me. And I was having very little dietary fat, very little carbohydrate, probably sub 50 grams of carbohydrate. And in the context of a competition prep, my body's burning through that easily. So I was most definitely in what most of people would today consider a ketogenic diet, but I did not feel good. My, my energy was subpar, my hormones tanked, my testosterone was in the, in the toilet. I mean, everything was bad nothing was optimized. I was able to get very lean. I was able to, to place well at that show, but I certainly didn't feel or perform optimally. And if, if your goal is just simply to, to, you know, lose weight, then there's a lot of different ways to do that, but we're trying to figure out how to optimize that weight loss and sustain as much muscle as possible and feel great doing it. And I don't believe that's going to happen in the context of hardly any dietary fat coming in. Yeah, I think it's good. Um, I, I hear so many stories about people that do competition preps and then after it, um, they follow the lean, uh, the high protein with like limited fat. And then mm -hmm. afterward they're struggling with disordered eating for a very long time. So I, I think it's, I commend you for bringing this type of alternate way to eat and be healthy and safe and still be able to perform and compete. I think it's so valuable. And I think that's why your book is so, so important in this space. You know, there's a lot of people that ask me, um, I'm an athlete, so I need a little bit of cars. Oftentimes I'm like, I don't really know. I think you should go talk with uh, Robert <laughs> Sykes, but they'll say, should I eat maybe like 20, 30 grams of carbs before I work out to perform better? Or should I, and then I've talked with like Danny Vega and he says, it might be better to co uh, consume it after. Have you seen what's better for the body? Well, I haven't had carbohydrates in seven years. Uh, so it's been <laughs> quite some time for me and it hasn't seemed to negatively impact my performance at all. Um, I keep getting stronger and faster and my, my performance continues to excel. So I'm not really I'm not really an advocate for carbohydrates in that regard. Okay, I feel like okay. a lot of people advocate carbohydrate consumption from a muscle glycogen standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as the faster study illustrated way back when it was published, you know, once you become deeply fat adapted, your body's ability to preserve muscle glycogen is significantly improved. And your body's ability to replenish muscle glycogen is also quite effective in the context of zero dietary carbohydrates. Um, so, so that's all a plus that's all in favor of not consuming carbs for muscle glycogen standpoint, when it comes to, you know, energy, when I, my personal philosophy and theory is that if you stay in a ketogenic state for quite some period of time, your body just becomes that much more efficient at using fat, fatty acids and ketones for energy at high levels. I mean, I'm able to do explosive sports. I'm able to do endurance sports. I'm able to do all these things in the complete absence of carbohydrates. And I mean, it's not just me, like there's people all over the world that are doing this. So it's not like I'm an anomaly here. Um, so I, I do not think there's a strong argument that carbohydrates are going to significantly create a better uh, athlete than the one that's not consuming carbohydrates. The, the main caveat is people need to truly become fat adapted in order to truly tap into that full potential in the absence of carbohydrates. I see so many people, you know, they kind of, you know, teeter totter, so to speak, and they'll, they'll do ketogenic diets for a month or two, and then they'll do something else and they go back and forth. And that's not going to bode well for truly optimizing for any given diet. So if you're, if you're wanting to go the ketogenic route and not consume carbohydrates, then feel full, fully confident you can excel whatever your sport is without carbohydrates. Just don't, you know, dip your toe into the water into multiple different diets. Yeah. I had a client that was using honey before working out. And he said, that's the only way I can really lift a lot more and do explosive movements. So what I recommended him taking your keto brick instead. And so he gets the wave versions and he, he loves it and it's helping him bulk up because he was having an issue getting enough calories in, but that was an option for him. And he thought he needed the honey or the carbohydrates, but actually he didn't. These athletes will tell me, no, I can tell that I'm not lifting as much because of what I'm able to lift. But if people feel that, is it because they're just not in a ketogenic state or 
Is it that nocebo effect? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of it is psychological. There, there could be like some electrolytes. So if you're deficient in electrolytes, that's not going to, I mean, if your sodium and potassium equilibrium is off, then you're not going to be able to get a great muscle contraction or a power output. So you obviously want to make sure your electrolytes are in check and you're hydrated. But if that's the case, then you are truly fat adapted and you have been so for you know, six months or more, ideally even longer than that, then you shouldn't have any issues from a performance standpoint. If you're, you know, getting in enough calories, enough fuel, enough fat for energy, uh, you shouldn't have any issues there. So I think a lot of it is, is the, the traditional dogma within any, any sporting event, especially bodybuilding. It's like, you've got to have carbs, you've got to have carbs. So it's just ingrained in people's way of thinking. But once you do it without carbs and you are able to excel, it's like, okay, it kind of opens the door as to what else is possible. And then you remove that mental stigma. And then you, before you know it, you're doing everything just, just perfectly fine. Let's talk about training volume intensity. There are some advocates that say lift as heavy as you can, and then a lift to failure. And then that's good enough. And then there's some people that say, you know, do a little lighter weights. And then it's more about uh, repetition. What are your thoughts with that? Yeah. So there's, there's a, it's some of it's going to be personal preference, but ideally you want to implement progressive overload. So you want to progressively overload the body in some form or fashion to give it reason to grow and build more muscle tissue. And I've personally found that to be better amplified in the context of lifting heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to, you're going to stimulate your deep muscle tissue fibers. When you lift heavy, you're going to activate the central nervous system. When you lift heavy, you're going to really give your body reason to grow. If you lift heavy, that said, you don't want to lift, you know, one single rep, really, really heavy. And then that be the only rep that you ever do for a given exercise or movement, because you need more volume than just that one rep is going to offer. So there's a, a balance uh, to be made there. So typically, uh, given the option of doing a single rep for very heavy or, you know, a lighter set for 50 reps, I try and find some, some middle ground there. And I'll typically recommend people train with the eight to 12 rep range. Mm -hmm. Most studies agree that that's a pretty good for me muscle building hypertrophy standpoint. So if you're lifting heavy and intensely implementing progressive overload as often as you're able, and you're training within that eight to 12, eight to 15 rep range, you should be covering your basis and ensuring that you're providing the proper stimulus to elicit that growth. Okay. And do you recommend this for whether you're a bodybuilder, or if you are just the you know average person just trying to maintain lean body mass? Yeah, that's going to be a pretty good rep range for, for anybody. And a lot of people also are under the impression that uh, when you, when you try to lose body fat, that's when you need to lift lighter and do more reps. Like that's what you need to do to tone is what they say. Um, but the reality of the situation is your body's ability to preserve the lean muscle mass that you have in the context of a caloric deficit is going to be significantly enhanced if you are continually overloading the body. So if you're trying to lift heavy, even in the context of a lower caloric intake, it's going to be harder because you have less fuel coming in, but that's one of the single best things you can do to preserve the muscle mass that you have built. So rather than dropping calories and uh, dropping the weight, try, even though it's going to be hard, try and maintain that weight that you've been training at up to that point and throughout the cutting period. And then in terms of lifting, you know, I hear some people say do a whole body workout of weights. And then some people say, no, you can target certain muscle groups is, do you have a certain way that you recommend people uh, working on their uh, building mass? And then is it how often do we need to work on certain muscle groups? So a lot of it, there's not going to be any one standalone, like this is the universal best okay. way to go about it. A lot of it kind of like nutrition is going to be what's most sustainable and enjoyable for you, because if you enjoy training that way, you're likely going to be able to adhere it for a longer period of time. So generally speaking, I recommend training a given muscle group on a, you know, twice a week, ideally would be pretty good from a frequency standpoint. So what I personally like to do is I'll have like an eight day rotational split in which I'm training for six days out of every eight day block. And in those six training days, I'm targeting each muscle group twice, one with a hypertrophy focus. So I'm lifting with a little bit higher rep range of, you know, 15, 20 reps and one with a more of a heavy focus. So I'm doing more compound movements, a little bit lower rep range, but a little bit heavier. And that way I'm kind of bridging the gap and, and getting the best of both worlds, so to speak. When I do cardio, I have a lot more energy, but when I lift weights, some days I'm dragging after mm -hmm. and I'm just tired. And sometimes I feel like I need a nap and I never nap. 
Why is that happening? So you're going to burn a lot more calories and okay. you're taxing your body and your central nervous system quite a bit more with resistance training than you are with cardio. Okay. So that, that stands to reason. That's why you'd feel more depleted and tired afterwards. Uh, you may need to just increase, like if you're going to start training more frequently re with resistance training, you may need to basically just increase your basal uh, intake of calories, like your baseline caloric intake. Because if you're fueling yourself properly, giving yourself enough protein to recover and enough fat to, to energize your training, as long as you're not overtraining, which is actually quite hard to do, right. you probably should feel better. I mean, there's an acclimation period in which your body is going to get adjusted to that level of training, and that may require you to be sore for a week or two. But if you increase basically all baseline factors, your training and your nutrition, that uh, you know enhanced soreness should definitely start to wear off. Okay. Yeah. I don't get sore as much. I mean, a little bit, but it's more that I feel tired. Like I just, my energy just feels a little bit lower, but maybe I just need to increase my protein. So that's interesting. I did yeah. notice that. And so I would tell my husband, this is why I like, um, I like doing cardio way more than I like lifting, but <laughs> you guys have all, you know, really just proving your case that I need to lift more than I need to do cardio. So I promise you'll, you'll be better off if you lift more than you do cardio, always prioritize the lifting over cardio. Okay. Okay. Duly noted. Like body recomposition is not a trivial thing, especially if you're doing so, you know, gradually over the course of several months, which I would encourage everybody to do. And the mindset aspect of it really comes into play because it takes a lot of discipline mm -hmm. to, you know, be adherent towards your macronutrient intake, to be adherent towards your training. So I really try to take a, a mindset perspective and really dive into that aspect of body recomposition in the book. I've been through these different phases so many times myself. So for me to be able to kind of paint a picture of what people can perspect, uh, you know, expect as they're going through the phases was really important for me because if you're doing all this for the first time, you, you lack complete perspective. You have no idea what, what's coming, what's looming. And that fear of the unknown is what oftentimes derails people. So I really wanted to kind of, you know, pull the curtain back and show people, hey, this is what you can expect at this phase of this journey. You know, if you're feeling these things, if you're experiencing this, then you're in the right spot. If you're not, then let's tweak a few things. So I really try to touch on the mindset piece. Yeah, I, I love that your whole message with everything you do is, not only is it just to be a peak performer, but also to share how to do everything with optimal health. And I love that you also talk a lot about your previous struggles with disordered eating when you were eating super high protein without any fat and how mindset is really important and how just all these other components matter when not only when you're lifting, it's just not only focusing on certain muscle groups, but also making sure your nutrition is really important and again, making sure your hormones are um, intact. And, and I love that you brought up mindset in this. Can you talk about maybe like one tip you talked about of mindset in the book? Yeah. So I think, I mean, it all kind of boils down to sustainability for me and it's not sustainable to uh, be at competition prep levels of body fat indefinitely. Like I, I would not be able to, you know, perform optimally if I'm in 3% body fat year round. So I track my macros, I track everything, I get everything dialed in for that prep. But then I, I transition to more of a building phase in which I'm a little bit more lax with how accurately I'm adhering to my macronutrient goals. And I feel like going through these building and cutting phases is kind of like an ebb and flow and a yin and yang to mm -hmm. ideal body composition. Because every time you cycle through those phases, you're ideally improving your starting and stopping position. That's what makes body recomposition sustainable for the long haul. That's what makes a ketogenic you know, diet in this context and setting for body recomposition, truly the fountain of youth. I mean, you're getting better with every single year that passes as opposed to worse and worse and worse. I mean, muscle mass is the longevity organ, as people have said. So optimizing for that in a sustainable fashion and truly embracing the fact that, hey, when you're in a building phase, you're going to likely have a little bit more body fat. And when you're in a cutting phase, you're likely not going to be as strong, you know, truly adopting both of those and, and you know, jumping fully into them with open arms uh, and expecting that the forefront is going to be key because that allows you to get better with each year that passes as opposed to constantly being in this perpetual state of dieting or just constantly, you know, building Like you really need to dial it in and have that yin and yang relationship. So that's really what I tried to illustrate with the book. Yeah. I think it's really helpful. And there's all these like graphics and images and even like charts. And I think it's really helpful. Um, I've, I shared your book in my stories the other day. And I got so many DMs. I never told you this, by the way, but awesome. um, I got a, a lot of DMs about people just loving your book and loving your content. So just, yeah, I wanted to share with you. Appreciate that. I think the world of you, Judy. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, where can people find this book? Uh, where can people learn more about you? And then if you have any tips for people to just get started to building a little bit of lean body mass? 
Yeah. So uh, for me, ketosavage.com, that's where I'm at online. That's where I'm at on social. The book is ketogenicbodybuilding.com. And there's a, if you go to the, the, it's on Amazon as well, but if you go to ketogenicbodybuilding.com to get the link for Amazon, there's a download, uh, a free download for a spreadsheet if people want to use that to track their weigh-ins and macros. Um, And as far as tips to get started, you know, honestly, just simply getting a, a solid baseline. So many people have no idea what their actual caloric intake is. They have no idea what their macronutrient split is. They have no idea what their body fat and lean muscle mass uh, composition is. So tracking for a week, eating intuitively, and then tracking that to see where they're, where they're coming in at, getting a DEXA scan to kind of get some base numbers there, uh, and just kind of identifying what their, their foundational baseline is, is first and foremost. Out of curiosity, um, I know you struggled with disordered eating, but for people that have had eating disorders where it's a little bit more, I guess, serious, um, do you recommend that they even get into the body composition world? I absolutely recommend getting into the body composition world. I don't necessarily recommend getting into a uh, deficit like competition prep. They, they may benefit from having a strategic building phase sure. more so than a you know cutting phase. What I've found when I was going through all this sort of eating tendencies, especially if they have, you know, some, some issues with accepting body fat, when, when people realize that there is a positive that comes with being at a healthy body fat, as opposed to being incredibly lean, when you recognize that there's a benefit to that, it's much easier to embrace it. So there's no need to be 50% body fat, but if you're, you know, 15, 20% body fat and a little bit pudgier than you'd like, but you're able to see, Hey, look, I'm getting stronger with each week that passes. I'm strategically implementing a progressive overload program with my training and I'm getting better from a performance standpoint. My sleep is better. My energy is better. My metabolism is better. My hormones are improving. When you recognize that it's much easier to embrace the fact that, Hey, I'm not sub 10% body fat. And then when you do that, it makes the whole process more sustainable from the get go. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I will put all of your information in the show notes. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you, Judy. Always a pleasure. Okay, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I always enjoy speaking with Robert. He's such a wholesome guy that genuinely wants to just help people get to optimal health in the most safest way that you can be a bodybuilder and do it in a way that is beneficial for your body and not adverse. If you are doing a protein sparing modified fast or doing extended fasting long-term, it's just something to consider that it may not be beneficial long-term. Everyone will be different. And so we're not saying that no one can do it, but there are just tendencies of people for some people that it just may not be the best thing to do. I hope that this conversation provides you some more levers to get to optimal health. Make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Take care guys. 